The worst food additives that you can find on a label hmm. are usually weaved in along with other things that sound scary that aren't so bad. So we need to educate, we need to learn what these things are doing in our body so that we know what's truly good and what really we should be staying away from. So let's jump right in. The first one is red dye number 40. Now your first red flag should be the fact that it's derived from petroleum. Maybe not the best thing to be putting in our body in the first place. But there's been a lot of interesting anecdotal links with red dye number 40, which is why it's heavily investigated right now. We've seen a lot of allergy issues, seen a lot of anecdotal reports of migraines, and a ton of mood and hyperactivity issues, especially in kiddos. Now, there was a study published in The Lancet that took a look at a lot of dyes, including red dye number 40, taking a look at like 137 three-year-olds, over 138 to nine-year-olds, they essentially found that all of these synthetic dyes seem to be affecting their mood and hyperactivity, not just red dye number 40. So when you start seeing the food colorings that have numbers, you should be somewhat concerned. But most of the spotlight right now is on the red dye number 40. So you're seeing more and more brands just pulling that out because there's plenty of other solutions. You can use red coloring from beets, you can do, they're figuring it out. So we're seeing less and less of this, but that's probably the first thing to be careful of. Now, I need to be able to showcase something that's not so bad. We're gonna go back and forth with this video. What to avoid, then what's not so bad. This next one is guar gum. First of all, we see guar gum and we think, oh no, this is some synthetic gum. Guar gum couldn't be further from a synthetic gum. Guar gum is a gum made from the guar bean. Okay, the guar bean is very similar to a green bean, just higher soluble fiber, which means that it has a high affinity for water. So it draws water in and it creates viscosity and it creates thickness. Okay, so it's used as a stabilizer and a thickener. In fact, there was a study published in the journal Pharmacognosy that took a look at guar gum and found that it was better at controlling glycemic response than even pharmaceutical interventions for blood glucose. Okay, so guar gum being a high soluble fiber can slow down the absorption of carbohydrates and actually control glucose, so it could actually be positive. There's also been positive influence on lipid profiles. Now this would be short term because it means that the soluble fiber is slowing down the absorption of dietary cholesterols, which evidence suggests that dietary cholesterol does not influence our serum cholesterol all that much, but it can in the short term. The bottom line is, Either way, this is a good thing. So you're gonna see things like guar gum in maybe protein powders, maybe yogurts, maybe some cottage cheeses. That's not where I would be concerned. There's other things that we wanna be pointing our fingers at other than just guar gum. So the next one is calcium caseinate. This is one that you probably wanna stay away from. And it's not because calcium is bad, and it's not because casein is bad. It's because when you have these concentrated amounts of caseinates, these caseins, that's when you start running into a potential inflammatory issue. Now, calcium caseinate is usually used as like an emulsifier, they'll use it as a thickener, but sometimes they'll straight up use it to inject more calcium into a food to alter the nutritional profile. A lot of the problem is that this calcium ends up being treated with calcium hydroxide, which can impair the ability to absorb nutrients properly in our digestive system. So we are impacting how we absorb other nutrients by taking in this adulterated, weird lab created calcium caseinate, right? And then when you look at the casein side of things, casein is a protein. It's naturally gonna be in cheeses and milks. It's fine, okay, but when you have this concentrated amount, we run into a potential issue. There was a study published in the journal Functional Foods. Granted, it was a rodent model study, but a lot of these studies start there. Okay, so it demonstrated that when caseinates, like these concentrated amounts of casein were added into these rodents diets, they had a 33.8% increase in monocyte chemoattractive proteins. Okay, these are what are attracted to a site to draw inflammation up. Okay, so basically you're looking at these MCPs are a precursor to more inflammation. Doesn't mean that calcium caseinate is gonna end you. It means if you're having it every day, that might pile up in your body and it's something that, again, is under investigation, so we may wanna have some consideration there. Next, we jump into one that you may not wanna be so afraid of anymore. Okay, that's ascorbic acid. If you take a vitamin C supplement, 
you're probably taking ascorbic acid. Most vitamin C supplements are synthetic vitamin C. Okay, now that's not necessarily what I would recommend, but the point is that I wouldn't be freaked out if you see something that has ascorbic acid on the label. In fact, there was a study published in the Journal of Chiropractic Medicine took a look at a meta-analysis of 13 studies, okay? And what they demonstrated was that ascorbic acid up to about 500 milligrams per day was actually protective. It protected against lipid peroxidation in the brain. So it's technically an antioxidant. Yes, it's synthetic, but it is an antioxidant that's providing a potential positive benefit. Now, if you can find food that doesn't have it, that's great, opt for that. But don't run the other direction because of ascorbic acid. There's other things you should be more afraid of. For example, things like titanium dioxide. This one is so bad that the European Union is looking at removing it, or they at least removed their stamp of safety approval on it. It hasn't been banned yet. It is what they use to give like a shiny consistency to like Mentos, things like that, right? Skittles, that shininess. But they're also starting to use it as a UV protectant. Because it's shiny, it can reflect UV, so they can use it to stabilize things for a longer period of time. This is dangerous because it, well, it, it, we're ingesting something that is kind of like, a, like this like nanoparticulated metal, okay? Now, some of the research has suggested that it triggers the microbiome to create what is called a biofilm which is a protective layer that surrounds certain ecosystems of our bacteria. Sounds like a good thing, except it can do this to good and bad bacteria, which means it's protecting them and disrupting the natural cycle within our gut. Okay, it's like if you went into a forest and you blocked off all the wolves so that the wolves could never die, you'd have tons and tons and tons of wolves that would envelop the ecosystem and throw everything off, right? But there was another study that demonstrated that it didn't directly impact the microbiome, but it directly impacted the metabolites created by the bacteria in the gut. The metabolites created by the gut bacteria are the most important piece. That's what allows us to get the benefit of a healthy gut, right? It's these metabolites that are produced that allow for better glucose response, better fatty acid utilization, these short chain fatty acids. The, pur the purpose of the gut is not to just digest our food, it's to signal with the rest of our body so we have this synergistic relationship. If these gut metabolites are thrown off, we're ruining the benefit of the gut. Now I wanna escalate to a few things that really need to be highlighted. There is so much misinformation out there, so many people making wrong decisions about this stuff, so many people plastering stuff on social media that's outright wrong and we need to kind of discuss it. Before I dive into that, Today's video is brought to you by Sun Warrior. So if you're looking for a plant-based protein powder that does not have a lot of the junk in it, that's where you wanna look. Okay, it's the one that I use personally. They have one called their Active Line, which is super, super cool. It's utilizing pumpkin seed protein, which is one of the most complete plant proteins that you can find, along with some really cool things. Okay, so they've added some probiotics into the mix to aid in the microbiome benefit, but they've also added enzymes. Not a lot of protein companies doing that. Okay, now Sun is not just a protein company. Obviously, they've been around for a very long time with a wide spectrum of things, but their active line protein is really something great. So I put a special link down below that'll save you 20% off if you wanna check them out. So 20% off that entire active line. So whether you wanna try their active creatine, whether you wanna try their active protein, or anything else that you feel like you want to try. Their hydration line is really great as well. So you're not having all the hidden, nasty, weird stuff in there. Just a good, quality-based, clean protein that gets you to your goals that allows you to get a little bit more digestion. So that link is down below. Again, 20% off using that special link and code in the first line of the description. Natural flavors. Such a hot button topic, okay? Now I say this because if you go onto some people's channels, they'll say, natural flavors run the other way. Then if you talk to some of the brands, they'll say, wait a minute, no, 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 like our natural flavors are fine. And it's like, who do you believe? Do you believe Bob on the internet or do you believe the brand? And nine times out of 10, people wanna believe Bob on the internet because they think that the brands are all like trying to do something terrible. I don't disagree. I think a lot of brands are doing shady things. But with natural flavors, the good guys get roped in with the bad guys because natural flavors is a very large umbrella. Now I have a direct strategy for you to follow 
to ensure that you find products with the right kinds of natural flavors. So the Flavor and Extracts Manufacturing Association has actually started putting out a word of caution with natural flavors because they're saying, okay, like, these expert flavorists, these people that can just create amazing tasting things, they're using so many different micro flavors to create the perfect profile, it's impossible to trace really what's in it. So they're saying, hey, maybe natural flavors aren't what we all think they are. And that's true. The bad news is the regular brand that's doing something good, that's using a natural flavor derived from a strawberry, is getting grouped into the same category of flavor scientists that are using literally up to 150 what are called incidental additives to make a flavor. And they're getting grouped in with that under this general umbrella of natural flavors. It comes down to trusting the brand and looking at the other ingredients. It is not a guarantee, but it helps you a lot. First thing you can look at is ideally you wanna find something that's like natural flavor from strawberry or natural flavor from vanilla bean. That's their way of being able to kind of like designate that, hey, we're making a better choice. Don't group us in with the garbage. And unfortunately, a lot of it is garbage. But look at the rest of the ingredients. If they're using organic XYZ, if they're not using weird things, if they're not using titanium dioxide, if everything else in the ingredient label adds up 100%, you can almost bet that their natural flavors are going to be in the good category. Now on the contrary, if you look at the label and you see titanium dioxide, and you see some of this other stuff, you see red dye number 40, and then you see natural flavors, you can pretty much bet your bottom dollar that those natural flavors are in the bad category of natural flavors. Now we are starting to see some movement towards being able to designate and articulate natural flavors a little bit more, but that might help you choose the right product a little bit more. Sodium phosphate, as we get older, I'm a believer that we should be concerned with this. Some people will say, well, sodium phosphate is just a loose term for salt and phosphate. And we don't really know the ratio, it's just salt and phosphate, and how could that be that bad? Well, when you look at the studies, like one published in the Archives of Internal Medicine, they found a direct correlation with increases in serum phosphate, like so blood levels of phosphate, and a high correlation with cardiovascular disease. Is that really a risk we want to take when it's avoidable? If sodium phosphate was in literally every single food, it would be a different story. But the fact is, when you go to the deli meat section, you have options. You can put down the one that has sodium phosphate. Okay, I would recommend things like Applegate. Okay, Applegate Naturals has pretty darn good deli meat selection without the sodium phosphate in it. Costco has some that doesn't have the sodium phosphate. So yes, it's organic material, salt and phosphate. But what they're doing to synthesize it is a completely different ball game and it's entirely avoidable. So I think that that's higher up on the list than some of these other things like nitrites and nitrates because those can be naturally occurring from celery and that can be a complicated discussion. So I'd rather not even discuss that. So be paying very close attention to those sodium phosphate levels. The last one I wanna to touch on is one that you shouldn't be concerned with. And I've done enough grocery haul videos to see the comment section where people are saying, why would you pick up something with citric acid? Citric acid is bad. Citric acid is literally citrus. Now, in the case of citric acid, sometimes it's synthetic citric acid, sometimes it's literal natural citric acid. There's a study published in the Asia Pacific Journal of Tropical Medicine that found that having citric acid in ended up improving lipid peroxidation levels in the body. Again, it actually helps neutralize some of these free radicals. It's kind of like saying, like, oh, I'm gonna have a small part of an orange, but without the actual sugar component. Should you be avoiding things that have citric acid? No. If you have an option to have something that doesn't have it, and it's equally good, then sure, anything that's questionably synthetic could be an issue. But at the end of the day, with all of this stuff, we need to look at the big picture. Okay, that is not what's hurting us. It's these copious amounts of hyperpalatable things and these copious amounts of things that actually impact us, not a little bit of citric acid. So I hope this video cleared some stuff up for you. And as always, I'll see you tomorrow.